Welcome to this talk. This is Bruce Schneier telling us about the NSA, their capabilities, and countermeasures that we can have against them. Thank you very much. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening to this. Uh, to me, the coolest thing about all the uh, NSA disclosures of the past six months have been the code names. I think code names are pretty neat. There actually are not enough code names in our lives, and I think we need to sort of learn how to use code names better. I'm going to list a few of the code names. Uh, first code name I'm going to talk about is Muscular. Muscular is the code name for the NSA top secret program to collect Google and user data by eavesdropping on the trunk lines between their data centers. Uh, this is probably done with the help of Level 3 Communications. Level 3 was Google's provider. Uh, we know Level 3's code, NSA code name is Little. I think as a general rule that if your data supplier has an NSA code name, you're probably pretty screwed. <laughs> uh, this is actually different from the NSA's program to collect Google and Yahoo user data by eavesdropping on the links between the, uh, the, the browser and the web server. We don't know the code name for that. But that was probably done with the help of AT&T and, and other the telecom companies. Uh, we know AT&T's code name for at least some of this is PRISM. There's a lot of code names associated with the, with the telcos. Uh, Stormbrew is one. There's, there's, there's a bunch there. Uh, this is different from PRISM. Uh, PRISM is the code name for the top secret NSA program to collect Google and Yahoo user data by asking the companies directly. That's one set. Uh, another really important code name which, which people here should learn about is Quantum. Uh, all those other code names have to do with passive eavesdropping. Quantum is the NSA program to in actively inject packets into the backbone. Right, so there, there are these massive computers. They have code names like Tumult and Turbulence and Turmoil. Well, well Tumult also allows data to go back in, as opposed to just being extracted. And there's a lot of different code names associated with quantum. There's quantum insert, which is their packet injection attack tool. Uh, we're pretty sure this includes 302 redirect injection and DNS packet injection, possibly also TCP re uh, rejects. There's quantum cookie, which allows uh, the NSA to inject a packet in a stream going back to a user that forces them to divulge its cookies and uses that to identify users. Right? So you might be browsing anonymously, someone pokes at you and suddenly you're divulging your Facebook cookie. Right? NSA keeps a data database of cookies so they know who people are. Also something called quantum hand. We saw that in the, uh, in the presentation about uh, I'm blanking on it, the anonymity service, Tor. The, the presentation on Tor, we don't know what Quantum Hand does. Uh, Nicholas Weaver speculates that it's a command and control system uh, for NSA malware, which I actually think about as a pretty cool use of, a, of, of an injection system. Uh, there's a bunch of other quantum, quantum programs. I think one of the things we can do usefully is think about what a system like, that, like this would look like, how it would work, what sorts of things it could do, and that'll help us figure out how to design around it or design against it. And, and it's, it's probably true that it does the things we think it does. Uh, another code name which is related is Fox Acid. Fox Acid, I think, is actually one of the coolest code names they've got. Uh, Fox Acid is what they call an exploit orchestrator. Think of Metasploit with a budget. Uh, <laughs> these are computers that sit on the, on the network when something like quantum uh, forces you to redirect to that computer. It knows who you are because it's been told offline, and it, it sends you different malware. The malware has all sorts of code names, uh, Validator, United Rake, uh, my vote for NSA's stupidest code name, Egotistical Giraffe. <laughs> Actually did not make that up. Uh, the uh, particular exploit that you are served is determined by a program that is codenamed Ferret Cannon. Uh, validator happens to be the default exploit that, that, that's run against you. I assume it's a Windows. Uh, and after your own, there are various implants. And it, we've seen a bunch of these. 
We saw some of these from uh, that uh, book of, of Tao implants. We saw some from a, uh, a Le Monde uh, document that was released a couple months ago. Uh, there are a lot of really cool egg, uh, implants, black hot, mineralized, vagrant, high lens. Some of them are designed to uh, jump air gaps. Some of them are designed to pull what's on the screen. Some are designed to pull passwords or find other things. Uh, there are exploits designed to exploit printers. Uh, lots of surveillance tools, uh, co-traveler. Uh, uh, Evil Olive is an IP location database. Lots of analysis tools. We've seen Marina, we've seen Pinwhale, we've seen Mainway, right? Bull Run. Bull Run's the codename for the NSA program to uh, basically subvert internet products and services. Uh, there's a lot here. I mean, I, I don't think anyone's done the full codename glossary. Probably worth doing. There are certainly hundreds out by now. Right? The documents are just littered with code names. Some of them we don't actually don't know what they even know what they mean. We just see them in passing. Some of, the doc some of the pages from that uh, Tau implant catalog are just sort of full of code names we can only really guess about. Uh, the, the meta moral here, I mean, the, the sort of the meta story, the, the individual stories keep coming, right? Just last week we learned about uh, the, uh, the text message database, right? And the collection of, of text messages that's going on. And I'm just blanking on the code name for that one. Uh, the, the, the meta story is that the NSA has turned the internet into a giant surveillance platform. Right? And what's important is that it's robust. It's robust politically, it's robust technically, it's robust legally. Right? I mean, I started this presentation by naming three different programs to collect Google and Yahoo email user data. Uh, these are three different technical accesses relying on agreements or at least cooperation with three different companies and relying on three different uh, legal justifications. And that same thing is true, I think, for cell phone data, for internet data, for everything else. There's a lot of redundancy in the system. And when we think about solutions, it's important to realize that point solutions are, are, are hard because these aren't point problems. Now, the NSA continues to lie about its capabilities. You know, we're, we're, sort of, we're sort of learning the NSA codebook for lying. Right, we're sort of learning their, their tortured uh, def interpretations of words like collect or incidentally or target or directed. So when they say things like, we don't collect data, they actually, what they mean is, well, we collect it, but we don't count it as collecting until we actually look at it, or a person looks at it. So all that computer stuff isn't collecting. Or when they say, well, we don't, we don't directly target Americans, it means, well, you know, we, we get them, but this is not on purpose, or you know, incidentally. Uh, we know they cloak programs in multiple code names to hide their extent and capabilities. So you'll see a different, really the same program with different code names. And anytime you ever hear some of the NSA saying, we don't do this under this program or under this authority, the odds are 100% they're doing it on some other program under some under authority. Uh, another thing that's not coming out, I think it's also real important, is, is, is the data sharing. There's a lot of sharing between different organizations. You know, the NSA, CIA, FBI, DEA. We know some of this, right? We, we knew from, uh, there was a Reuters story that actually had a, had a slide from an NSA document that talked about the NSA sharing data with DEA and instructing them to lie about where it came from in court. I mean, like really illegal. Uh, I think there's a lot more sharing going on between NSA and FBI, not just of data, but of technologies. And we know uh, uh, quite a lot about the FBI's uh, technologies for eavesdropping on, on cell phone calls, right? Stingray and some of those sort of fake cell phone tower technologies. We saw the same things in the NSA uh, TAO toolkit. And it, it's, it's improbable to me that these are being developed independently, that one person, de one agency develops them and they get shared. I think also legal cover is shared. There are companies that, that will say, we don't cooperate with the NSA, and I think largely they're correct. They cooperate with the FBI, who's the front for the NSA, for whatever program is being run. Right? So I think there's a lot more moving around between agencies. 
Uh, NSA's mission, well, we know what it is, right? We, we, we can see it in, in the documents. Uh, Glenn Greenwald gave a talk at, uh, at CCC, and he, he talked about the, the slogans, collect it all, know it all, exploit it all, and these things permeate documents, right? And, and you can see it in the NSA's almost uh, you know, methodical moving through every communications technology trying to capture data, including you know, chat rooms and virtual worlds, you know, which sounds ridiculous. Uh, but if, you, if you're thinking in terms of we have to collect everything, it makes perfect sense. Why would you leave that? Why would you leave that channel un eavesdropped on? A and to understand this mission, you really have to understand the NSA's history. I mean, the NSA is born out of the Cold War. When we were singularly interested in everything happening in the Soviet Union. And it was almost a voyeuristic interest. We had to know everything. And that collected all mentality was focused on the Soviet Union, on the Warsaw Pact, on China, right? on, on the countries that we were eavesdropping on. And we collected an enormous amount of data. Right? There's a lot less data then, so collected all you know, it sort of made some sense. So you had certain trunk lines, you needed to listen on them. And you get a lot of data, right? Some of it's useful, some of it's not. Tactical data is much easier to deal with than strategic data. Right, you have a much easier time figuring out the capabilities of the new Soviet tank than you do predicting the fall of communism. Right, I mean, social trends are hard. Uh, that sort of ubiquitous surveillance, that mentality, really should have died with the Cold War but it got a new lease on life with the terrorist attacks of September 11th. Because the intelligence community was handed an impossible mission, right? Never again. Right? Those were their orders. Right? And never again is ridiculous. You can't actually do it. But if you think about it, if you get that kind of quixotic goal of, of making sure something never happens, the only way you could possibly achieve that is to know everything that does happen. Right? So never again forces you into know everything. And that mission was aided really by, by the natural trends of information technology. And I think this is another important thread we really have to, to understand. You know, fundamentally, data is a byproduct of the information society. Right? Everything we do on computers creates a transaction record. Data is a byproduct of our information society's socialization. Right? Every time we interact with people using computers, it creates a transaction record. Usually of the actual conversation. Right? Voice is the exception. But a lot more of our conversations happen not in recordable form, but in recorded form. That the act of having a conversation is in a text session means it is recorded. Right? This, all this data is being increasingly stored, increasingly searched, increasingly used. And this is just Moore's law. Data storage drops to free, data processing drops to free. It is way easier to save everything than it is to figure out what to save. You all know this is true. That's how you deal with your email. <laughs> right? I mean, I remember because I'm old enough to remember, the moment, I mean, I used to sort my email. You'd throw away what you didn't need, you'd put it in different folders, depending on who you were talking to, depending on topic, however you sorted. But there's a year I stopped doing that. I put everything in one folder, and that was the year that search became cheaper than sort. And it made no sense. I mean, that's the world we're in. Right? And the effects is that, that we're all leaving digital footprints throughout our lives. Cloud computing just exacerbates this because our data is just moving away from our control. And lots of things become possible now. The notion of wholesale surveillance. I mean, it's sort of fascinating that the NSA is putting everyone on the planet under surveillance, but they're doing that because we're all carrying cell phones. Right? The cell phone system, by definition, puts us all under surveillance. Just like email does. Right? Just like, I don't know, ATM machines do. Right? All those things produce data records. So wholesale surveillance, surveillance backwards in time, 
the death of ephemeral conversation, we're not really there yet. I mean, it's mostly true for politicians. We're now living in a world, at least in the U.S., where pretty much every politician has someone from the opposing party following them constantly with a video camera and looking for a gaffe. Right? That kind of surveillance will become the norm everywhere within a few years. You know, maybe it's Google Glass, maybe it's something else. But ephemeral is going to disappear because they won't be the ability to have those conversations. Or systems that never forget. I, I think this is the, probably the biggest change that we're not ready for. I think a lot of our societal, a lot of societal lubricants in the fact that we have lousy memories. You know, when I can go home and, and, and replay an argument with my wife from two years ago to prove I'm right, I'm not convinced I'm better off. <laughs> right, but that's going to be possible. Right, the result here is a public-private surveillance partnership. There's a basic alliance of government and corporate interests. Right, NSA surveillance largely piggybacks on corporate capabilities. I already mentioned cell phones. Right, I've mentioned internet cookies. Right, all of those things sort of happen everywhere. Uh, there's an uh, NSA program called Happy Foot that tries to geolocate cell phones through apps that transmit location completely separate from the NSA program that tries to geolocate cell phones through the cell towers. Right, there's overt and covert collection. I mentioned Google in level three. And overt collection has a variety of forms. Right, we, we, we see cooperation, you know, ask nicely. We see bribery, we see threats, we see legal compulsion. Right, fundamentally, surveillance is the business model of the internet. Right? We build systems that spy on people in exchange for services. That's the way a lot of the net works. And the NSA is happy to piggyback on a lot of those capabilities. Right? The result is the golden age of surveillance. I mean, this, this is the golden age of surveillance. Even if there wasn't malice because of the way our systems naturally work. Right, uh, you know, but yesterday again, uh, President Obama talked about, don't worry, it's only metadata. I don't know if you saw the speech. He said, we're not listening in your phone calls. Uh, I'm really getting tired of that, metadata equals surveillance. And, and an easy thought experiment bears this out. Imagine you've hired a detective to spy on somebody. And that detective would plant a bug in his office, his home, his car, and you'd get a report of the conversations he had. Right, that's what the president says he's not doing. If you ask that same detective to put that person under surveillance, you'd get a different report. Where he went, who he spoke to, what he read, what he purchased, what he looked at, right? That's all metadata. Right? Metadata equals surveillance. And when you have all this metadata, I think the metadata is actually a lot more valuable than the eavesdropping data. Because it tells you a lot more about what's going on. And the NSA has some very sophisticated analysis tools to deal with all of this metadata. Uh, we saw some of them in the Washington Post article on cell phone location data. We saw some hints at the, at the tools the NSA is using in this database. And some of them are pretty cool. They have a, they have a program that looks for phones moving towards each other that turn themselves off and then turn themselves on again about an hour later, moving away from each other. Right? They look for secret meetings. It's kind of neat. They have the cell phone data of, of US agents, which they track. And then they look for cell phones that are, or, or series of cell phones, that are basically paralleling their location. They're looking for tails. They have a system, and I'm not even sure how it works, but they try to chain together burner phones, right? Burner phones are disposable phones. If, if you watch The Wire, you know, what, you know what a burner phone is, right? So they're used for a certain amount of time, but if you're a person who uses a burner phone, if you think about it, you use one, then another, then another. And if I have a database of those short-lived anonymous phones, and I know the location, I know the numbers they're calling, I could probably do a pretty good job chaining them and figure out who the person is, even though they're using burner phones. I mean, that's just three examples from one database. I mean, you know, think about the text, text message database, think about the email metadata database. Put, start putting them together, 
You, get, you can get a lot of information. Uh, something that I, mean, I, think, I think our community knows, but I ha often have to say this, especially politically, that this is really not just about the NSA. It's actually not even just about the United States. I mean, the, I mean, the, the United States spends more on intelligence than the rest of the world combined, but you know, this is what any nation state would do. Right? We're better at it. We have a very privileged position on the internet, right? both in terms of, of the companies that build and operate the internet, and the connectivity tends to flow through the US. But this, these, these techniques are all general. You know, we know this uh, quantum packet injection is how China runs the Great Firewall of China. And we know other countries do, do these same things too. I mean, what's happened is the Snowden documents have given us this extraordinary window into the, into the NSA's activities. And it's just, you know, too interesting not to really look at it. Right? But other countries do this, and technology spreads. Right? There's nothing special about these techniques that make them, you know, not usable by others. I mean, today's secret NSA programs become tomorrow's PhD theses and the next day's hacker tools. So in a lot of ways, the stuff we're seeing out of the NSA today is a three to five year window on what the criminals will do. I mean, a lot of those uh, tau tools were embedded pieces of hardware used to subvert systems. We're already seeing those in point of sale terminals to steal credit card numbers. You know, and this is fundamentally the harm. I mean, when you think about the harm, here's where it is. Right? We have built an internet that is secure for everyone. Right? We have enabled the panopticon. We have enabled this ubiquitous surveillance. Right? We now have a complete loss of trust in the technologies, loss of trust in the protocols. Right? I mean, that NSA Be Safe toolkit is, is an interesting example. Right? Here's, here's an area where we know that the NSA has influenced a random number generator in a popular crypto toolkit, made it the default, you know, and spent $10 million to do that. It was, it's a sort of interesting program. I think it's largely a failure. That one seems to largely have failed. Because we we're not hearing much about products that have used that. I mean, a lot of people looked at it and said, this is a dumb random number generator. We're not going to use that. We'll use another one in the standard. But that's certainly not the only one. I mean, the program didn't stop with that particular subversion. But the problem is, we don't know any others which is an enormous loss of trust. Who do you trust? We have no idea. You know, I, I wrote an essay where I talked about some of the metrics you might use to figure out who to trust. Right? Big US companies, bad, you know, small open source, good, but we're just really making it up. Right? We're just trying. We don't know. Right? And also this loss of trust in the institutions. The internet governance model is kind of broke right now. Right? Because it really, until now, it's been largely a benign U.S. dictatorship under the general belief that the U.S. was acting in, you know, vaguely the world's best interests and we could just let it be that way. And that turns out not to be true. And we have nothing to replace it. So we're just sort of flopping along right now. I mean, there's a lot of details we don't know. And I think we'll never know. There's this... There's nothing about cryptography in the documents. I looked. Right, these, these are really all on the SIGINT side. There's not a lot of code, a lot, a lot of uh, company names. That PRISM slide was a ginormous exception. Generally, all company names are hidden behind code names, and code names are never defined. There's something called ECI, extremely compartmented information. Basically, it's not written down. So we will forever only know companies by code names. Now we have some in the telco. Remedy is BT, there's another, another one. You know, we, we know some of those, but a lot we're just never gonna know. And there'll be a lot of programs we don't know. I mean, the documents really are just shadows of what's going on. So there's still gonna be a lot, a lot hidden. But we have to deal with this, I mean, this is what we have to work with. We have to work with all of this ignorance into what exactly has been subverted, right? And what exactly has been turned. And we have a choice to make, right? As people who design the internet, who use the internet, 
And it's not a choice between does the NSA spy or not. It's a choice between uh, <coughs> an internet that is vulnerable to all attackers or an internet that is secure for all users. Right? That's our actual choice. Right? The problem is we have made surveillance too cheap and the solution is to make it expensive again. Right? There's good news, bad news about encryption. Uh, Edward Snowden, in his first interview after his name became public, talked about this. And he said, I'm going to read his quote. He said, encryption works. Properly implemented strong crypto systems are one of the few things you can rely on. Right? We know this is true. This is the lesson of Tor. Right? The NSA can't break Tor and it pisses them off. Right? This is the NSA, uh, this is the moral of the NSA program to collect uh, buddy lists from the, uh, the browser to web server connection. You look, they, they had numbers of the amount of data collected, and they collected about 10 times the amount of data from Yahoo as from Google, which kind of makes no sense because Google might have 10 times the number of users as Yahoo does. But once you realize that Google is using uh, SSL by default and Yahoo isn't, that does make sense, right? The unencrypted connections are more fruitful. Right? This is also a lesson of muscular. There's a great handwritten back of the napkin slide where the engineers are describing how they get the data from, uh, from Google's backbone, they point to the space where SSL is removed. Right? Encryption works. And in some ways that's surprising, but it's true. Uh, unfortunately, you know, then, uh, Snowden said this in the sentence right after you, the one I just read. He said, unfortunately, endpoint security is so terrifically weak that the NSA can frequently find ways around it. Right? This isn't news to us either. Right? The way to break crypto is to get around it. We do know there is some piece of cryptanalysis the NSA has, right? some, some secret thing. Uh, there's, there's, there's the basic anecdotal evidence. Right? NSA makes this huge investment in mathematics that's, that's unparalleled anywhere else in the world. They hire about the top 10% of mathematicians every year out of US universities. And more interestingly, there's, there's, a, there's a sentence, uh, the black budget, the intelligence budget, was, was leaked. Uh, it was a Snowden document, I think in August, maybe September, I think it was August. And uh, it was a few pages of the budget and an entire introduction by James Clapper, the director of national intelligence. And there's a sentence in that doc, in his introduction. It's kind of out of context, but it's really worth listening to for the exact words. Uh, He's saying, we are investing in groundbreaking cryptanalytic capabilities to defeat adversarial cryptography and exploit internet traffic. Okay? Now that doesn't sound like we've hired a bunch of really smart mathematicians and we're putting them in a room and giving them a lot of computers to hope we get lucky. Right? That sounds a lot more like we have a piece of, we have something that's at the edge of, of usability and we're you know, building the massive computer or doing the massive pre-computation or designing the massive hardware. We're doing the engineering thing to make it work. Right? That's how I read that. That they have something, but there's sort of an engineering issue. Uh, I, ha I had three guesses of what it is. Uh, I, I was given a fourth a couple of days ago. And, and so, so I'll give them all in sort of no, no real order. Uh, the first one is, is elliptic curves. Right? There's a lot of math in elliptic curves, and it's easy to imagine that there is some, there's a lot of math we don't know about elliptic curves. And either some general advance or some advance in certain classes of elliptic curves, that if you can force curves into that class, you can have a, a leg up on breaking them. We do know that the NSA uh, has affected curve selection, so, so they're, they're that, that's a decent guess. Uh, second guess is, uh, is general, some kind of general factoring technique. You think about factoring in the academic world, it gets better every year, factor of two here, factor of 10 here, factor of 100 there. And you can plot how factoring has improved over the, over the years, over the decades. You know, you give the NSA five, two, 10 years advantage, however you might want to characterize it. You can sort of think of where they are. Right, the third guess is, uh, is RC4. You know, RC4 commonly used on the internet uh, still secure, but kind of just barely, right? Lots of, of, of things we have. We don't really know how to exploit. As you can imagine, you know, for another five years of cryptanalytic advance, someone could, uh, could figure it out. 
Uh, the one I got last week, uh, sorry, earlier this week, was from John Kelsey, who suggested uh, random number generators. That a lot, of random number, a lot of random number generators have really lousy entropy. And that is kind of a candidate for a massive pre-computation attack. That if you sort of know exactly in what way certain RNGs are bad, you can use that to you know, extraordinarily pare down your brute force searching. And it's sort of, that's an interesting example. I mean, even, but even all this, we know that most current cryptography frustrates the NSA, at least at scale. Right? Individually, no, but at scale, yes. Right? We know that the most of the way NSA breaks crypto is by getting around it. And when Clapper says that crypto doesn't give them much trouble, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about getting around it. Right? Bad implementations, default and weak keys, sabotaging standards, right, deliberately subverting products and services, and, and what the NSA calls exfiltrating keys, that's code for stealing. Going in and stealing keys. It's effective. And mostly the NSA relies on unencrypted streams of data. Right? A lot of it, this stuff is not encrypted. Internet data, cloud data, cell phone data, other third party data. Right, it's out there in the clear. As uh, Target just learned, I guess. <laughs> right? So here's the problem. Right? We, we've made bulk data collection too easy. Right? It's easier for the NSA to collect everything than to Target. Now, solutions are going to be complicated. Right? They're, 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 it's a complicated problem. There's no easy solution. And it includes you know, government self-correction, technical measures, legal measures, international cooperation, and I think a major shift in how we think about security and privacy. And I want to run through, I think, some of the, the ways I think this will get fixed. Uh, the first one are the self-corrections. Inside the NSA, things have changed. They have to have. Right? As, amazingly it may, as, as amazing as it is to all of us, the NSA had no contingency plans for all of their secrets being leaked. Right, if you remember the NSA's responses to the first month, they had no clue what to say. It took them like seven, eight, nine weeks to get a PR firm with a proper security clearance so they could like get a good message. I mean, now they're good. They have, they have do press releases, they have a blog. I mean, they're really good about being on message, but it took them a long time to get there. Right, that, that's over. Right, the cost-benefit analysis has changed. The NSA, I think, is gonna have to incorporate the risk of exposure in anything they do, right? The political blowback has been kind of enormous here from, from our allies. And that's it. I mean, if the Snowden document said the NSA was spying on North Korea and the Taliban, nobody would care, right? So the NSA spied on Belgium, or worse, the GCHQ spied on Belgium, which I guess is like Nebraska spying on Connecticut. <laughs> right, but, but you have to assume that the, the, nat the nature of secrecy is changing. That it used to be in, in intelligence, you'd, you'd come in out of college, you'd go into the club, you'd have a job for life, right? You'd be part of the inner circle. And that's the way secrecy worked. You, you tell anybody, you know, under 30, job for life, and they laugh at you. I mean, I mean, Chelsea Manning was, what, on a four-year tour? Edward Snowden was a contractor. They, they knew they had no job security. Right? So it's different. And, and I have to believe that the NSA now has to look at their programs and say, this is going to become public in three to five years. Is it okay? And that changes the risk analysis. I think as a, a self-correction side government, President Obama talked a bit about that yesterday that maybe we shouldn't do things just because we can do things. And the collect everything metaphor, which was, you know, is General Alexander and General Haydn before him, you know, that maybe that isn't the right thing to do. Right? There are limitations to intelligence. You know, there are all of these studies that showing this is not effective. And I think this is gonna change, you know, how we view intelligence. That the voyeurism just isn't worth it because the cost is too great. 
There'll be there are corrections inside corporations. Before Snowden, it cost you nothing to cooperate with the NSA. And if you were a company, and, and the telcos did this since the 40s, you know, throughout the Cold War, cooperating with the NSA is what you did. The internet companies were a little more taken aback. There's a little more fighting back. But still, everyone believed this would never become public, and you can do it with impunity. And now corporations know that's just not true. There's enormous uh, reputational loss when it comes out that you cooperated, and there's enormous reputational value in fighting. We see Apple and Microsoft and Yahoo and Google, they're all uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook to some extent, LinkedIn, they're all fighting publicly. Right, the hardware companies less, the telcos almost not at all. But even, even that's changing. Right, there's a pushes against AT&T to divulge what you're doing, to fight back. And that's just going to change the calculus because you just can't rely on this cooperation anymore. That's self-corrections. Uh, there's a lot of things technically that we have to do. And a lot of this relies on, on this notion of bulk collection. Right? I mean, the NSA might have a larger budget than everyone else combined, but they are not made of magic. Right? They are constrained by the laws of economics, the laws of physics, the laws of math. Right? And the, our goal has to be to make bulk eavesdropping more expensive. I don't think we'll ever eliminate targeted collection. I mean, that NSA toolkit that we just saw at the end of last month was from 2008. I'm sure it's a lot better now. I'm sure it's very, very good. If the NSA wants into somebody's computer, they will get in, period. But that's, star, that's targeted. That's, I, I think that's okay. It's the bulk stuff that we want to deal with. I mean, and there's a lot of things we can do here that involve redesigning protocols, redesigning defaults. Right? Ian talked about some of this, this yesterday. But the more we can encrypt the backbone, the better we'll do. Right? Encrypting the backbone makes quantum go away. Right? Provides real security against bulk attacks. More importantly, provides cover traffic for those who really need it to stay alive. Right? More encryption in the cloud, more perfect forward secrecy, which right? is more things that raise the cost of doing it in bulk. Right? Anything we can, do, we can do to redesign products and services. And, and we know user level application encryption is hard. Remember the 20 year lesson of PGP is that one click email encryption is one click too much. Right? On the other hand, OTR is a really good lesson in how to do this successfully. Or hard drive encryption. I think I think my, might be our biggest success story in encryption. That it is so easy and so transparent and so invisible, there is no reason world for everybody not to encrypt their hard drives. I mean, you never even notice you're doing it. Right? It comes default in, in the operating systems. We don't trust those. There are, there are various third-party packages. Right? More endpoint security. The NSA documents talk about PSPs, personal security products. And, and, and they, they give them trouble. They don't like them. Right? That, so the more we use them, the better we are. Right? More open standards, more open source, right? things that are hardest, harder to subvert. Another big thing I think we need to go back to is target dispersal. We were way more secure when there were 100,000 ISPs than when there were 100. I mean, having these massive targets is very dangerous. I mean, not just technically, but legally. Right? A single Google, a single Facebook, everybody on Gmail. You know, we actually don't want this. And the last thing is assurance. And this is the hardest, but this is, I think, the most important. We really need to figure assurance out. We need to be able to prove, demonstrate, somehow, that the software we use does what we want it to do and doesn't do anything else. Now that, that, I don't think that's, that's nowhere near near term for anything, any reason, anything reasonably resembling modern software. But that's extraordinarily important. Because right? a lot of this surveillance re relies on these hidden capabilities. 
But so largely, you know, despite all this, this is a political problem. And it's a difficult political problem. In the US, we are long past the point where simple legal interventions can help. And yesterday, Obama talked a lot about one particular data database, the, the cell phone call record database collected under one particular legal authority, 702. I think the odds are zero that that is the only way the NSA gets that data. And if they don't get it, the Brits get it and give it to us. I largely think that 702 is a crumple zone and, and, and the real capabilities are behind that. I mean, we know in general what the solution looks like, right? Transparency, oversight, accountability. But how exactly that works is going to be really hard. And our problem is that laws lag technology. And the techn technology is always ahead of the legal regime to, to restrict it. So, you know, the NSA is always going into these new technologies with everything because there's nothing stopping them. I mean, there's a quote, uh, General Hyden, the previous uh, NSA director, said, I think it was on a TV interview, and he's talking about his, his limitations. And he says, give me the box you will allow me to operate in. I'm going to play to the very edges of that box. Right? That makes sense until you realize that technology expands his box constantly. So if he's pushing the edges, by the time law gets around to noticing the box is bigger, it's too late. You reduce the capabilities. And of course, even if we do succeed, reigning in the NSA only affects the United States. It's not going to really affect non-US persons, despite what Obama said yesterday. It's not going to affect the, the actions of other countries. And you know, when, I, when, I, when I talk about this in, in, in other environments, I very often get this sort of response. You can't stop the NSA because if you do, then China will do it. I mean, that's fundamentally an arms race argument, right? There's a zero-sum game here, us versus China, whoever your enemy is, and if we don't do it, they will and they win. And, and, and that's a really bad position to be in, I think, and I think it's a wrong way to frame this. What we have to do is get the world to realize that a secure internet is in everyone's best interest, that it's not us versus them, it's security versus insecurity. And once you do that, you turn a zero-sum game to a positive-sum game. You have laws and treaties to support it. You have technology to support the laws. You set up other laws, other technology to deal with non-compliant actors, the state and non-state. It doesn't make it easy, but it makes it like any other one of the hard international problems. Right? Money laundering, nuclear land proliferation, human trafficking, small arms trafficking landmines. I mean, it's very hard to make those work internationally for all the reasons you know, but at least we all know vaguely the direction we're moving towards. Right? We all sort of know the goal. Right? And the goal is security versus surveillance. And if you think about that, that's the NSA's dual mission. Right? Securing our stuff, eavesdropping on their stuff worked great when our stuff was NATO and their stuff was Warsaw Pact, works less well when our stuff and their stuff are the same, works really badly when the administration tells you to eavesdrop on everybody because a terrorist could be everywhere and they're striking at any time or constantly, help, we're scared. So the, the two missions go out of balance. And what we need to do is rebalance them. And even more so, rebalance them weighting security more than surveillance. Right? I mean, the surveillance here is robust. Again, politically, legally, technically. A and we need to solve this, not just for the NSA, but for everybody. For the other governments, cyber criminals, rogue actors. I mean, I think a secure internet is vital to society. And I, I think we need to move forward to get there. I mean, near term, I actually don't think for a minute we'll win the stop doing this argument. We might win the tell us what you're doing argument. And I think that would be worth it. Right? For us, we need to fight futility. A lot of times when I talk to political activists, especially from, the, from, from third world countries, there's a lot of futility out there. There's nothing I can do, therefore I should do nothing. 
That's wrong, that's bad. Right? Everything we do makes it harder, makes it better. And fighting the sense of utility is real important. We need to do that. <clears throat> we, need to, we need to fight the balkanization of the internet. I think that's the worst blowback from the NSA surveillance. The idea that some countries will make their own internet somehow, even if that's possible. There's enormous value in a single global internet. And we need to figure out uh, who we can trust. We need to figure out the new governance models. You know, what organizations, right, not the ITU please, but something. And I think we eventually will win the protecting is more than eavesdropping argument. I mean, it might not be for another 10 years, but I do believe that is where we are headed. And then when someone says, well, if you don't do it, China will, you, you can say, well, just because China builds a Maginot Line doesn't mean we have to. That would be dumb. Because fundamentally, that's what's true. And really, I'm going to end with this. You know, this problem is much bigger than the NSA. I mean, in general, this is about data. It's about data sharing. It's about surveillance as a, as a model of business. And it's about the societal benefits of big data versus the individual risks of personal data. Right? What do we do with data that benefits society as a group versus that same data that is personal to individuals? Think of it as behavioral, behavioral data for advertising. Think of it as medical data, as education data. Actually, medical data might be the easy way to explain it. I mean, if we put all of our health records in a massive database, that would be enormously valuable for research. Yet, incredibly personal. How do we deal with that? I mean, how do we extract the group benefits of data while still protecting individuals? That's really what this NSA debate's about. And that's just one of many debates. I think this is the fundamental issue of the information society. I think solving it will take decades, and solving it is what you know, the historians of this era are going to write about, because that's what's important. So thanks, and I'm happy for a few questions. So there's a microphone in the middle standing there, and that's going to be the question mic. So you would have to run over there quickly. Yes. Am I literally the, am I literally the only one? Um, Actually, you're figuratively the only one. Figuratively. Literally, yeah. I work with a uh, PhD physicist who's a admittedly pretty paranoid guy, but um, he's utterly convinced that the NSA has a functional, working, classical quantum computer that is capable of decrypting SSL in real time at line rate on 10 Okay, gigabit so let's have a show of hands. Who thinks that physicist is paranoid and dreaming? <laughs> so that's what I thought, but I want okay, to know what you think. Okay, who thinks he's right? Okay, Ooh. I vote for paranoid and dreaming. By a lot. I mean, we can factor like 15, I think. And, and we're, quantum computers are, are, are nowhere near... The, I mean, yes, of course they have a program to do research. I mean, why wouldn't they? It would be embarrassing if they didn't. No, this is really science fiction. The world would be very different otherwise. I, I don't think that's even remotely possible right now. It would be cool if I was wrong, wouldn't it? But I, I just don't think so. I mean, this is the problem with a lot of this stuff, right? I mean, on the one hand, it's really, really cool that the United States kills people with flying robots. On the other hand, oh my God, we kill people with flying robots. Ah! Right? Right? This is fun. <laughs> Makes it really hard. Yes? Hi, Bruce. One of the publicly stated uh, purposes of the Utah facility is AES-256. You know, God, if I, had the U, U, if I had the Utah facility, I wouldn't waste time on that. I mean, I, the Utah facility, I believe, is for data storage. So data storage, data processing of all of this metadata. That they have these massive... Uh, data mining algorithms, like some of the things I talked about for, uh, for cell phone location data, and they just need all the data to be in RAM somewhere, on disk, I mean, it needs to be close, it can't be on tape. 
So they need facilities that can move this data around in and out of processing and do parallel work with it really efficiently. That's what I think that is about. I mean, AES-256 is a lot more data than would be there, and I think it would be a waste of their time. I mean, the real hard thing here is analysis, not getting more data. Right? Breaking the message between A to B that was encrypted, they know the message is there, they know how long it is, that's good enough. Let's figure out what's really going on. So they're not just mining Bitcoin? Sorry? They're not. I didn't hear that. I said, so they're not just mining Bitcoin. They, you, you. <laughs> if they wanted to mine Bitcoins, they'd use your computer. Hi, can you say anything about your meeting with Congress earlier in the week? Uh, not more than I said on my blog. I mean, the meeting happened. Uh, it was kind of, kind of weird, but I mean, the meeting was, we, we said it would be off the record. And, and it was a candid, interesting conversation with people who are reform-minded, and I'd like to give them as much leeway and ability to do what they want to do as, as possible. So I'm not going to say anything. I'm not used to, you know, that kind of good guys on all sides of the aisle. So it was really kind of neat. Um, how does the alignment of public companies and their, what their interests are play into this? Because you still have, you know, or com private companies, rather, um, who do have different interests. And so, you know, they're developing potentially models that, you know, do undermine some of the privatization um, or the privacy kind of interests that you're talking about. So if you have public um, or corporations that are doing one thing and then you kind of, against the interests of what you're talking about, how do you... How does all that tie in together into a solution? I, I'm worried a lot about, about private corporation surveillance. I mean, I'm worried a lot about surveillance as a business model of the internet. I'm worried about, I mean, in a, I read this recently. Someone said, well, you should worry less about the NSA because they're just trying to protect against terrorism as opposed to, you know, Facebook and Google who are trying to psychologically manipulate you to buy things, right? So on the, on the one hand, that, that makes sense. On the other hand, the, the False alarm problem is really different, right? If, if, the, if Facebook gets it wrong, they show you an ad for a Chevy you don't want. If the NSA gets it wrong, they drop a drone on your head, right? So, so there's differences there. I think both are a worry. I think the interplay is a big problem. And I th that's why I think this, this is a bigger question than the NSA. The NSA is just one aspect of this. I'm having watches waved at me from all directions, so the rest of you in line, I'm really sorry. I'll be out there. Thank you very much.